Hello and welcome to the latest Envcast episode. Envcast is a Society for the Environment podcast, bringing you environmental professionals in conversation each month. Each episode is designed to provide insight into the life of registered environmental professionals, featuring experts from across a wide range of sectors and disciplines. We explore what they do, why they do it, how they got to where they are now, and their future ambitions. Each guest has verified their environmental credentials by achieving Chartered Environmentalist, Registered Environmental Practitioner, or Registered Environmental Technician registration. To learn more about the Society for the Environment or our environmental registrations, please visit socenv.org.uk. That's S-O-C-E-N-V dot org.uk. Enjoy the episode. Hello, I'm Phil from the Society for the Environment and welcome to this month's EnvCast episode. I'm back at my desk today, returning to a more familiar format after my adventures on the farm in the last episode. If you missed that one, watch it back after today's episode. Today's special guest gained their Chartered Environmentalist registration via their membership of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, or THIEM for short, in 2005, and therefore has a, a registration number in the 1000s, which makes them an early adopter, I'd suggest. They are also a fellow of the Institute of Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability and have worked with the likes of WWF and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, to name just a couple of examples. I am very pleased to be to welcome uh, Dominic Tantrum to Envcast. Thank you very much for joining us, Dominic. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon. It's very nice to have you. Uh, as always on Envcast, to start proceedings, I'm going to hand over to our guest to give us a flavour of what they, they currently do in their job. So I'm going to hand straight over to you if that's okay, Dominic. Okay, Phil. Um, I, I will try and do my best to describe it. So um, I work with a company called Terrafinity, um, which I founded with my brother um, in its current form since 2010, but we've really been doing the same work for the last 20 years and I've been working in sustainability for more than 30 years my since. Um, so I, I'm a founding partner. I'm um, responsible along with my brother for running the business and doing the work for our customers. I see. And I get the feeling that that's quite a broad spectrum of work, but we might get into that a little bit later. How's working with your brother? Well, it's it seems to be reasonably sustainable, given that we've, we've been doing it for 20-odd years in the last stretch. So, yes. Not that too bad. Tells you something. Yeah, some some people, the thought of working with their brother for that length of time uh, would be an impossible task, but uh, it sounds like it's going quite well. Uh, I'm always interested, whereabouts in the world are you joining us from today? So, I'm uh, southwest of uh, Guildford in Surrey, um, a little village uh, between Farnham and Galloway. Okay. So I'm nestling in the Surrey Hills. Okay, always good to know. We've had uh, guests from all over the place. So always, we should we should draw a map at some point. So, what do you do day to day as a, as a founding partner at Terrafinity? So, um, probably much the same as a number of sustainability consultants, but it will depend on what, to some extent, what size business you're in. So, because we're in a very small business. Not only do we need to do the work, the environmental stuff, but we need to do a bit of work actually running the business and getting work and ensuring that it's done and occasionally asking for a bit of money. Um, so so a lot of things. Um, I'm, I'm responsible for a lot of the consultancy, um, which I share with a brother, and a bit more of the business development and marketing work. So a, a really a, a big range of things. Um, so this morning um, I was updating our customer relationship management software, CRM software in the jargon, because we run a group for sustainability professionals, which meet on a monthly basis. And there's a bit of admin to keep that going, write the copy to invite them along, send the invites out, et cetera. So that was something I was doing this morning. This afternoon, I've got a couple of customer calls. So I'm picking up with um, some strategy work we're doing with one of our customers this afternoon. So different things each day. Um, covering a range of responsibilities. Interesting. And that group you were referring to, is that the Sustainability Professionals Resilience Group? That's right. Um, it was a group we set up uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic 
when everyone was going, oh my goodness, what's going on and what's happened to the world and how do we keep in touch with people? And like everyone else or most other people, I think we felt a bit at sea with that. Um, so we thought, well, let's just reach out across our networks, our groups and communicate with people, try and have a bit of discussion, find out what's going on. And it's turned out to be really quite a valuable group because sustainability professionals often, particularly those that work for companies, are often quite isolated. They're often one of, they're a single person in that role, or perhaps there's a couple of them. They have a lot of responsibility um, and not always someone to talk to in depth about challenges they face. So the, the ability to meet other peers, other people working they, is something that they tell us is really valuable and, and we find valuable too. So, Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I suppose that's something I didn't really consider about sustainability professionals being, being relatively isolated because they, they, they don't necessarily have big teams, it's fair to say. Um, and, I, I, and However, their reach across the organisation and the people they have to interact with with their projects, I guess, could be Quite far, I suppose. In general, yes. So it will depend slightly how sustainability is dealt with inside yeah. that organisation. Um, but generally speaking, for them to be effective, um, they they rely on other people. Mm. Okay. So really, a good sustainability manager is an excellent facilitator and collaborator because they need to get other business functions to uh, do the things that they need to be done. Yeah. Whether that's providing them information changing the way things work, building plans, strategies, etc. It can't be done by a single person. Um, now, often they're recruited and the organization feels job done, tick there, we've got a sustainability manager, we've taken care of that. That, that kind of attitude, unfortunately, is still around and can put quite a lot of strain on that individual because it feels like the responsibility is theirs to deliver sustainability in the organization rather than what it is really the other way around. That it's the organization has the problem, they're there to help um, fix it and move it along. So this is a bit of a support group as well as um, a knowledge sharing opportunity, I guess. It, a well, group, there's, certainly, there's certainly a thread of that. I wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't say we advertise that or even have no. any special expertise in it, but I, it's something that people have fed back that they, they really welcome, just that ability to connect and, and understand that Everyone has similar kinds of challenges and to understand how they deal with them and what solutions they found and just to feel a bit, bit more connected to other people with this, facing the same things as them. Yeah. What do you think about this and how have you dealt with this kind of situation? That kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Excellent. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I imagine that's been pretty valuable for a lot of people. What kind of topics do you cover? We cover all sorts of things that we think are on the plates for sustainability professionals. So um, while it's it's not just aimed at sustainability management, it's aimed at people at a senior level in organisations whose responsibility is sustainability. And that's wiping out these days. Um, we've just covered things like, so the next session in September is going to be about connecting with people. In fact, the very thing I was saying, how, you, how do you influence other people across the organisation how do you understand what their drivers and motivations are? How can you make your how can you orientate what you need doing and your ask to to their situation so that you can be both more effective in your job and useful to them at the same time? Um coming up as well, the month after, we've got one of our associates, Emma Barlow, who is a uh, carbon literacy trainer. She's going to come and talk about carbon literacy training and how that's useful in organizations. We've looked at um, issues such as materiality, which is uh, the jargon in corporate sustainability for what's important and what's a priority. Um, we've looked at dif different types of business challenges. We've looked at setting um, transformation targets. We've looked at strategy. We've had guest speakers from uh, leading companies in the building industry and others. We've looked at social value, all, all sorts of things, really, that will cross cross the path of a sustainability professional. And that kind of that the group that you set up, that's not um, part of the business in terms of a, a money making venture. That's, uh, that's something to support some of your contacts across 
sustainability consultant. Oh, absolutely. So it gives us a bit of insight, but no, it's free free to attend mm-hmm. and it's not a it's not a commercial offering though. No. Okay. No. Okay. So. Although you might gain some useful contacts from it. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um so that's part of what you that, that draws into some of the things that you're doing on a on a daily or a monthly basis with 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 that. Uh, obviously the planning and so on is uh, happens uh, quite frequently. Um but in terms of what you do as a sustainability consultant uh, in your day-to-day work, what kind of projects do you get involved in? So we, um, I guess, a, a strategy specialist. Lots of people say they're that. Um, it probably means slightly different things to different people. Um, what our main bread and butter is, is helping organisations work out either where to start in sustainability or perhaps more commonly these days, where to pick up, move forward from um, work they've already done. So we help them understand their situation, what's important, um, what they need to react to, who else is concerned, what the range of impacts are from a range, uh, arising from their activities and the things that they depend upon and the people that they depend upon and where that happens across the world. And getting some clarity on that, understanding their situation. Um, and we'll typically do that by carrying out a strategic review piece of work where we will interview staff across core functions in the business or the organization. We'll look at, um, we'll, we'll gather information and data about their supply chain and what they use and where they get it from. We'll look at what typically what their competitors and peers are doing. Um, we look how they position themselves. We'll ask, we'll get quite a lot of commercial data or certainly information about where they're positioning themselves and why and how they're looking to compete. And we'll bring that together to look at the situation and sort of see how sustainability issues, and when I use the word sustainability, that's both social and environmental issues, how they intersect with their activities and what they mean for them. Um, and in most cases, if you take a long-term view, and that, that is the critical word, long-term, sustainability issues are of strategic importance for most organisations, i.e. they can't afford to ignore them or they might, in fact, um, affect their actual ability to carry on operating in the longer term. So do you then provide, well, I suppose it depends on what the client's looking for in terms of outcomes, but do you then provide a... Um, a higher level strategic overview of what they should be focusing on to drive their sustainability plans forwards, or is that is it is it just a huge breadth of things that you that could come out with outcomes? Typically, yes. So it will depend what they want. So if if you like the strategic review provides a diagnosis, mm-hmm. um, it provides some recommendations as well. Often, um, most of the time we're we're then engaged to help move that forward. So understanding the situation as a as a foundation for developing a strategy to move forward. So then we would typically explore vision and ambition for the organization. Um, and that's not necessarily um, a, a, in any way a sort of wishy-washy sort of statement like some often corporate mission statements are. But vision really is to get a common shared understanding across the business of where they want to head to long term in terms of sustainability. Um, and we use a couple of tools to do that. One of them is a maturity or progression matrix, if you can imagine that. So it goes from uh, the one end sort of compliance. We will do sort of statements you probably and, and listeners have probably read. We will do what's needed to, to meet all regulatory and legal requirements, um, which really is the, the bottom end of the scale, to be honest. And up right at the other end of the scale are companies that define their purpose in terms of sustainability, of which there are a very small number, although growing. And often the business will be somewhere in between. You need to understand where they are to build a strategy for them because you need to know what they want to build and whether that fits with their business model as well. Because if it doesn't fit with their business model, you have to take a step back and say, are you up for changing your business model? In which case that's realistic. And if you're not, that's unlikely to be realistic as it stands. Unless there's a great change in technology or something. 
So exploring that territory is a useful part of calibration and direction for strategy. Where are we going to go? And the ambition part is how far and how fast are we heading towards that long-term vision in in a sort of typically three three to seven year time frame. So once you once you have that understanding, you can then start exploring and setting long-term goals, which is a best practice part of um, business sustainability, both in terms of driving performance, but also in terms of disclosure. People out, people external stakeholders want to know. They know that this business or organisation has some environmental issues. They want to know what's being done to manage them, and ultimately, or quite soon, some evidence that change is actually happening. So so the way you do that is to set long-term goals and targets and then measure the performance and then disclose the results as the data become available. So lots of talking to people, finding out the current situation, finding out what their aims are and then working from there. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Does the level of um, detail of your outputs or um, how much you're involved in the outputs, I suppose, depending on who you're talking to at the organization. Because you mentioned that you may well be working to with a singular sustainability professional. You might be working with someone who has this sustainability element kind of plastered onto their job title a little bit. I guess you're there, you're there, your support after, as the outcome would depend potentially on that and supposedly on their goals as well. Yeah, well, the sort of the strategic piece that I've been talking about for the last few minutes um, needs to involve senior people and senior management yeah. across, across the business. Um, you can't you can't do a strategic intervention with a single member of staff or even a single team. No. Um, while while that's the sort of um, main main part of our activity, and then the developing implementation plans on the back of that. Um, so that, that's typically a second phase of work where we would work with small teams uh, divided, uh, grouped around um, business functions to deliver those goals. So the, the work of those teams ladders up to produce those long-term goals in perhaps easy to describe pillars of a strategy. Hmm. Pillars is the language often used. So you might, you might say, oh, here are five main pillars of action. Um, Having said that, we are brought in by often by individual sustainability um, directors or managers to fix specific problems. That might be providing some training and up, upskilling people or tackling something that they're stuck on. So perhaps they're involved in either in, a, in some strategy work that we did a few years back or they did with someone else and they might get stuck on something and they'll bring us in for more of a point solution. Mm. Um, but the la larger part of our work, the strategy work, is it needs to involve at some point. It needs to touch s most people, most people, one way or another in the organisation. Yeah. Um, typically, that's the senior people and middle management and leadership. Okay. Okay. So from this, uh, I gather that communication is quite the skill required for for what you do. Um, but what? What kind of skills and qualifications have you gained, um, I suppose, during the process of being a consultant, but also before being a consultant to, to then to then work in the way that you do? Okay, um, uh, a handful. Um, so I I started off with um, a degree in human ecology, which um, still to this day, despite it being a long time ago, I I don't regret for one moment because it was a brilliant education. Um, it's not a very common course. I'm not even sure how many. Last time I looked, I think there was a master's um, still in it. But broadly, um, human ecology is a very holistic environmental degree, and it looks at the impact humans have on the environment, and the impact that the environment has upon humans. And it tends to involve, or it did when I did it, studying the first two years, almost every course available in the university. Um so environmental science and ecology, but also sociology, psychology, um, a little bit of philosophy we did, um, human uh, human physiology as well. So it gives you a really good grounding in how stuff works, how the world works. Then did a postgraduate um, 
for mature students in the countryside management. Really? Um, got most of the way through that. Um, and then didn't do the final year to turn it into a master's um, because I went back to my um, professor that I've been doing some consultancy work with and started to then fill, which I don't think I ever did anything on. I probably wrote a proposal, but uh, never got off the ground. And then he moved um, uh, to another university again and said, would you like to come with me and the rest of the research group and do a accelerated PhD. So without quite realizing what that involved, I said yes to that. Um, so I did a PhD, um, which is technically in geography. Um, and technically. It, um, well, it's very <laughs> yeah, 80s in geography, although I never, never think of myself as a geographer, Fair enough. I, I guess. And um, that's not, not to be rude, or hopefully not to be rude to geographers. Um, but just just don't see myself as a geographer. But it is job. It was geography in many ways. So that used um, that used a number of consultancy projects I've been doing for um, national parks and the Joint Nature Conservation Committee and um, English Nature as it was then, and Scottish Natural Heritage as it was then, and Countryside Council for Wales as it was then. And we've been looking at um, the data they used to meet. Um, their statutory requirements. And um, we'd done a review and audit of that, and there were lots of holes in it and things that needed to be um, improved, and we made recommendations on that. But the question in my mind was why wasn't other geographical data, including remotely sensed data, used a bit more? And part of it was ecologists, and this is going back 20 plus years, ecologists inherently uh, didn't trust it then. I don't know whether they do a bit more now. Part of that stemmed from the fact there were quoted error figures on these data, um, and they assumed that field-based, individual field-based data were more accurate, even though they didn't have quoted error figures on them. And in fact, when you looked into it, it tended to be a lot more inaccurate for a number of the uses that they took it for, such as understand inventorying habitat on a national basis. Um, so I, I used those case studies um, in the PhD, but then the, the, for the whole half of it, the second half of it was a whole load of data crunching in GIS, Geographical Information Systems, to combine different data from different sources to try and see whether you could improve estimates for habitat inventories on three different target habitats across the whole of the UK. Um, to which the answer was yes, you can to some extent, as as I as I thought beforehand. But the whole thing was was a sort of fascinating exercise in um, combining different things and exploring what what you can do with them. Blimey! So uh, I, I get the feeling there's a lot of uh, analysis within that kind of work, and that's something that you there, there was, and interestingly. I've done less and less of that as my career has progressed, actually. And a number of interesting things came out of that. So if you like, at that point, I was still laboring under the misapprehension that if you improve data, then you'll improve decision making. Wow. And of course, I began to realize as I did more work that it's not that simple. And yes, it is and can be vitally important to have good data and good mm. science. Of course it is. But getting using that to drive the right decisions is a totally different kind of fish so you started more looking more at the the whole picture started looking more at the whole picture um my brother had been working in corporate sustainability um and he he came back to join me as i said about 20 years ago and we'd also done i've done a lot of work on the natural environment and the conservation end including for um wildlife trusts and, and other bodies and realized that they were fighting, certainly Conservation UK was fighting a losing battle. Um, why was everything still going in the wrong direction in terms of sort of natural environment indicators? And I did do a lot of work on environmental indicators. So data like that, but trying to take incomplete data and say, how can we get answers that are useful out of it had been a big part of my work. And I'd done a lot of building in social 
data as well, particularly for protected landscape areas. So, but coming to this conclusion that data was part of the important part of the puzzle, but not the whole one. Also, that conservation was was sort of trying to patch it. It was like trying to hold back, um, sticking finger in the dam. It's probably the best metaphor. Trying, you know, it was fighting a losing battle. It had end of pipe solutions. So trying to defend um, small protected areas, which themselves weren't big enough, um, having done quite a lot of landscape ecology. And the forces ranged against conservation and still are against uh, uh, against conservation of biodiversity are truly enormous. So you look at the, the, the commercial budgets of companies, even what they spend on advertising um, to get people to consume more. Uh, uh, just the orders of magnitude larger money. Um, why are there so many more? I wouldn't I can't put a number on it, but people working in marketing than are in conservation or ecology. So we came to the conclusion that we'd work. We wanted to work more with businesses and ch- try and change the way businesses work because you know everything. Nearly in, a, in the market economy, we work in nearly everything that we use, um, buy, consume, eat, or transport. Everything is provided by a company. And um, unwittingly, perhaps, um, these companies are driving all the environmental impact. Um, and we, we thought we'd try and turn our attention to try and make a, if only a small difference there, that the, the, the scale of the, the scale of that activity was so much bigger than it was um, dealing with the conservation organization and, 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 that, and how the information we provide to them could could help further conservation. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that none of that's that that's all still very valuable stuff, but that's just where we decided to change our focus. So you're fairly driven by the need for change then? Absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense. I don't think you're alone in that in terms of the, the environmental professional community, it's fair to say. Um, your background gave me an indication of probably why you went for uh, membership with SAIM, which is has an ecology focus, I suppose. Would that make sense? Yeah, so I think I joined them back in 90, something like 93 or 4, mm-hmm. from memory. Um, I was doing a lot more natural environmental work than I do now. Um, and they were, so they came into existence when I just started working. Um, so I, um, while I, I'd been a member of the British Ecological Society, something a bit more practitioner-based appealed to me. It's, uh, in terms of, um, I'm quite intrigued to touch on the fact that we don't talk on MCAS much about the other skills required to do things like running a business, because we talk to, you know, we have talked to um, um, people who work for themselves, uh, that kind of thing, but we haven't really got to that part of the conversation. But if you were able to reel off a few different things, you mentioned marketing already earlier in the in the podcast, um, but what kind of things do you have to consider that people might not necessarily always consider in terms of running your business? So I think most of us, I'm sure there's some others that went in with their eyes more wide open than me, but most of us are doing it because we're interested in the environment or the particular aspect or species that we have in the environment. Um, and that's certainly what I did. And the, the bit, and I started a consultancy after I graduated. So I did, I sort of did it completely the wrong way around. Instead of going and getting a job on contacts and experience um, while being paid, I I started doing consultancy. Um, and at some point, you realise that you've bought yourself a sales job because you're also a salesperson as well as yeah. a marketeer. Now. It took me a while to realise that because the most of the early work I was described was, in a way, it didn't really have a sales element because it was it would be tendering for public contracts. Um, and again, not even particularly all that much marketing. You need to just make sure that everyone knew you existed and the kind of things you did and could could you go on a tender list if you were suitable. Um, so there was a little bit of marketing around that, but nothing that great. Um, if you start working for um, largely for businesses like we do, or or in fact charities um, and NGOs these days, then you do need to do some marketing. And if you're a one or two person business, then that means you've got to do it, um, or you've got to make enough money through the rest of your business to to contract that out and delegate it, um, which is, which is a very important skill as well. 
So it's getting your head round a range of things that you need to get done and finding out ways, um, becoming your own manager. Uh, that might be managing yourself to do them or as I, or I suggest delegating them. And I would strongly, there's a, there's a tendency or some, some people have a tendency to try and do everything yourself. I think that's a mistake. It's a, it's a really good plan to try and um, shift that on down to other people when you can. But some of it, um, like writing articles, which is a core part of what we do um, in terms of our outreach, our thought leadership, and our marketing, it's the sort of spine of our marketing, we have we have um, subbed that out to people. But at the end of the day, it's our expertise that people are interested in. That's the bit that sells us, the fact that we have got 20 years plus experience each on these things and our take on it, our ability to simplify and say this is the bit that's important. And um, most of the best blog marketers in the world haven't got that. They're probably much better at writing than I am, and they can take something and shape it and make it more effective. But I've I've got that thinking, or, or my brother has in our case. Mm. So it's it's understanding that sort of thing, managing your time really well, um, finding people either doing those jobs or finding people to do them, um, and managing that. Um, understanding what it is you do best and what it is much better off giving to someone else like an accountant or yeah uh, a marketeer or something well it makes a lot of sense i thought it's quite useful to touch upon because i think um uh, people will be thinking about the idea of going it alone kind of thing their own consultancy that kind of thing it might not be a consultancy it might be something completely different but uh and uh, in my other life i'm a wedding photographer as well so i uh I get the idea of running a small business and the challenges that I face. And I, I get the questions of, will you just take photos? Well, not necessarily. There's a business to run, which uh, some people don't quite get. So useful to have that kind of understanding. Um, now, back to your consultancy work uh, with your clients and so on. What kind of challenges do you come across? Oh, um, quite a few. Um, although there's a lot of things one way or another in common. Um, so often it's, I mean, where shall I start? One of the big ones is understanding what's important in actual fact. Um, and often often we're talking to non, non-sustainability, non-environment professionals. Um, they'll be really good at running their aspects of the business they're responsible for, whether maybe they're a marketing director or um, head of operations or something, and they'll know their business inside out and better than we do. But what they get is starting to get uncomfortable questions, um, perhaps from customers, and they may well have reacted to some of them and sorted many of them out, but what they can't necessarily do is knit them together or understand where to go next or how to improve or... In many cases, um, without, without citing names, one example of a multinational working with had done a lot of product-related improvement work, and it was really good. There was virtually nothing wrong with it. But what they couldn't do was answer the question of where is your company going and how fast is it going and how are you going to demonstrate it to us? So they could do it at a product level, but couldn't tie together the other aspects they needed, both social and environmental, to answer that question um, of where they were going and how, how they're going to demonstrate um, evidence um, of progress and impact reduction. So that's the kind of thing that we help people with. That's the kind of problem they struggle with. Some people want um, is interesting because some people come almost in in distress. Just as is probably a little strong, but they, they're they're being asked in invitations to tender or supplier requirements to meet a whole load of things they just don't understand. Others, interestingly, and there's not so many of them, but there are there, actually come the other way around. And then, and they're saying, we want to lead the fields and differentiate ourselves in sustainability. How are we going to get there? Hmm. Um, so we had that a couple of years ago with a, um, a Finnish IT company we've been working with. They're based in Finland, but all... <laughs> All, all across Northern Europe and, and now um, across the rest of Europe with a joint venture they have. Um, and they refurbish IT equipment. So um, they also lease it out. 
So they lease the IT equipment out, manage it while it's in use, and um, have registers for these assets. Then they take them back. They pay the um, the original customers some money for them. They buy them. And then because they've had visibility of them and they contract them, they refurbish them and then sell them for a second use. And so, so they're providing an important step in a circular economy um, function. And that's recognized in the EU taxonomy. So um, they really wanted to double down on that and, and make that central part of their, it always been an important part of their business model, but they really wanted to um, feature that and, and, and develop on that. So, so we helped them um, through the sort of strategy stages that I described before, but develop an ESG strategy yeah. um, that would help them meet those business objectives. So they, they came with a bit more vision and more forward looking than others. Um, others um, come with an idea that they want to do the right thing. They want to join things together. They know about some aspects of environmental sustainability, perhaps less on the social. What they don't know is how to get from a slightly messy and unclear situation where they are into a coherent planned one where they can demonstrate performance. So that that's the sort of journey we take them on. So I suppose that's one of the interesting parts of being a consultant uh, and, the, and the challenges question, because your clients, I suppose, have the challenge and they partly pass it on to you as your challenge. So is that a useful way of looking at consultancy sometimes? To, to some extent. I mean, interestingly, the because the work, the work we do is relatively non-technical. It's, it's about understanding, it's about prioritisation, it's about speaking consensus, um, clarity on a problem, it is about working out solutions, but those solutions will always require, they, they can't be provided externally by us. We can help um, illuminate them, but it's the company doing what it does and adapting its systems, its processes, its governance, its policies, the way it works that is going to deliver the change. So it's a, I mean, it's a little bit like um, saying, can you help me with weight loss? So yeah, you can have a diagnosis, you can give per people a prescription, that might be diet and exercise or whatever it is, but you can't guarantee that weight loss because the person has to take responsibility for it and make the changes that are needed. So our, role, our role's akin to that. Yeah, you know, advice, direction, yeah, that kind of thing. Excellent, makes sense. Um, what's your favourite part of your job? I think probably... Either in, either in training or running workshops. So when we explore things like vision and ambition, we will run workshops and we'll bring people in from across different parts of the business. Because what we're looking to do is we are looking to get an answer of how ambitious you are. But at the same time, we're, we're surfacing the whole range of challenges and issues in the sustainability sphere that that business has and letting people discuss and process them and come to their own conclusions. And that is as valuable, if not more valuable, than than some sort of answer about how ambitious are we, how do we how do we put that in a plan? And seeing pe it's seeing people make those connections and start to get some clarity. So sustainability is massive, it's global, it's intractable, horrible issues, many of which can't actually never will be fixed or we're talking hundreds of years to fix them, but they can be improved. So I think part of part of the understanding is is getting people to change their mindsets about that. But it's not it's not that binary. We're looking for improvement rather than when solving or curing. In many cases, that doesn't mean the improvement isn't massively valuable and important because it is. But but understanding that you're going to be moving the needle on something rather than fixing it understanding that you can step your way through all these issues and find a path of action that is useful and defendable. Um, understanding that that can mean saying you're not doing things. Getting comfortable with being uncomfortable um, is, is something we do because because there are always trade-offs. How do you, I'm not saying you do trade them off, but how do you trade off child labor in the supply chain for a t-shirt or a laptop computer and how many grams of carbon it emits um there's very different things 
um, and you have to you have to navigate your way through them. I was about to say I do enjoy those um, decisions, but not not in those particular contexts. But uh, in, in terms of unpicking the value of of what you should be prioritizing or thinking about in in so many different products and your choices in life and, and that kind of thing because it's you know by by making one change it doesn't necessarily fix it all which i think is partly what you're you're, you're getting at it and every element has a different kind of uh consideration to make um well it's a good example it's bad to say um i think that what you just said there in terms of your favorite parts of your job and what you said earlier about the fact that you you're you wanting to change things you want to you're, you're driven by changing things for the better i think um so the next question is do you feel like you're making a difference that's a really interesting question um yes and no yes and no is the answer so as as someone that's worked in sustainability as i said for 25 years plus or even more it feels it 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 always has felt perhaps slightly less so more recently, but still feels like swimming against the tide hmm. uh, or whatever whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, recently, um, there's been some work published. Um, I, sorry, I'm going to struggle now who it was. I think it was EY in Australia asking the question, is, is management consulting, is sustainability consulting changing and thinking called the behaviour? Of course, the answer was not much. Um, and it's not it's not surprising. Is it moving the needle on the big things like climate change and biodiversity loss? No, no. Is it doing something positive and useful when done right? Yes, I can say that. And I can say looking at many of the companies, and we don't work with many companies being small that we've worked with, we can see some tremendous changes in them and in their performance and in their reduction of environmental impact and their increase in the positive things they're doing. So I can look at that and say, yes, that was definitely worthwhile. And I I made a small contribution to helping make that work and making that happen. When you look at the wider picture, it's still difficult to be um, more optimistic about it. Even though I think many things have changed in the last two or three years, and certainly sustainability is pretty much on the mainstream agenda now in the way that it was it wasn't with um, most companies in the past. So the discussion is there. There's that horrible nagging feeling is all too little too late. But I think, you know, having put that time in over the years, you just got to keep pushing in the right direction as fast as you can, as effectively as you can, encouraging as many people as you can uh, to join you or do the bits that they can do. And... um. I, I hesitate to say hope because we often say to people, hope is not strategy. And that's to shock them into changing the things that they can change. But we do need a bit of hope. Hope's essential to keep people motivated and to keep things moving and to keep people taking action. And, you know, I I am definitely encouraged by, you know, what we can see in, in younger generations um, getting really stuck into environmental movement again you get the feeling that one of the key things you'd like to see is more change at a faster rate and um as much as you might not feel like you're part of the bigger picture imagine if there were a good few more thousand dominics doing this kind of thing multiply effect that would start to make quite a difference possibly yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, yes, if if people were using us and listening to us, yeah, right. <laughs> that was diplomatically put. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to change tact slightly on my questions. Uh, moving towards your professional registration, so you're a chartered environmentalist. Um, what? does that mean to you? You've been a chartered environmentalist for a good uh, 18 years now? What does that mean to you? It's, um, so what, one of the things that's interesting looking back is when when I joined, um, there was much less professionalisation um, uh, in the sector. Um, my email was much smaller. 
the CI were much smaller. Um, people were going around claiming to be environmental consultants with with no training at all, um, and that was frustrating. Having you know put time into chain, and there was sort of this. I mean, right back, right back in the mid nineties when I started, there was often people would sort of expect you to be a bit of a hippie. Um, and I would, I would put a shirt and sometimes a tie on, and I have a briefcase, and it was like, w what's this? You know, they're not really expecting some guy in a hair shirt. Um, and it was no, this is a serious business, and we need standards, and um, we need some structures, processes, we need career progression, we need to be taken seriously, yeah. And to do that, um, needs organisation. Um, it needs qualifications, it needs recognition of them, it needs describing that if you need something seriously important done, that you need someone that knows what they're doing, like you would if you were building a bridge or, or going to the doctors. So I, I, I saw it as, you know, part of the building, developing, extending that professionalism across the sector. Yeah. Personally, I'm very pleased that you used the bridge analysis because uh, I used that quite a lot when I'm doing presentations. Engineer, you, you'd expect there to be a chartered engineer involved in building a bridge. Why wouldn't you expect there to be a chartered environmentalist when it comes to designing something that's preventing habitat loss and, and that kind of thing? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's very good to hear. Um, so it sounds like the being recognised as an environment professional has been was certainly useful certainly then when um, people may have seen you as the, the local tree hugger. Um, has that, have you seen that kind of stigma change? Yes. Um, and interestingly, um, and I can't attribute them because we, in our, we referred earlier to our, our sustainability professionals group. We run a Chatham house rule in it. So we have good discussions, but uh, there's a lovely quote I'm going to borrow from one of our members who works for a, um, a big, um, food, fruit and veg importer, very big one. Mm -hmm. And she, she said, I've been, to paraphrase her, I've been in this company, I think she said for 18 years. When I joined, I was the hippie. Now I'm the person that's going to save the company. And I think, you know, that helps sum it up really. Um, pe people are, there's a general recognition that this, this is really serious stuff and we've got to get a better grip on it. We've got to take it seriously and we need skills and professionalism to do that. I'm a big fan of that quote. Hopefully that's outside of Chatham Rules that can be published somewhere. That's a fantastic quote. I like it. Um, and I think that leads quite nicely onto my next question, really. Um, what would you say to others thinking about career in the environment and potentially becoming a chartered environmentalist, that kind of thing. You could probably use that quote again. I, I could use that quote again. I would. Um, it's incredibly broad, so the space for all different kinds of interests, skills, and motivations. Um, I find it fascinating because, as I said, it involves even if you do a, a much more environmental inverted commas job than I do, it's still going to involve people. And making things happen are going to involve people. And um, you need to motivate people with their ideas. Um, the natural world itself, it obviously, is fascinating the way it works. So I find it fascinating um, and a source of inspiration and a source of calming down after sometimes, um, not that I have that many frustrating days, but like all jobs, you have has its frustrations. No, no job is frustration free. But I think part of it comes down to, you know, motivation and purpose, um, which is, you know, one of the buzzwords these days. But I sort of look at, I look back and I go, well, I'm actually lucky enough to always, I haven't ever spent much time worrying about what my purpose is, worried about how effective I am pursuing it, but not why I'm doing it. Um, and other people um, in other groups, I met, you know, there's a lot of, self-introspection and agony over whether what they're doing is worthwhile. So you could be sure you're doing something worthwhile um, and has very many fascinating aspects to it. Um, and professional organizations like um, Society Environment and Chartered Environmentalist are 
good ways to meet people, structure it, get your learning in, understand and see other perspectives, all of which are fascinating. Good. All of that sounds very positive. Why not? Why would you not want to go to an environmental career? It sounds great. Um, what? What's this? Is a very broad question. What's next for you? That's a very good question. Um, and I'm just setting six, six monthly goals. So it's a very pertinent one. Uh -huh. I haven't done them, so I can't. I can't exactly <laughs> answer it. We're looking. We're always looking to work with more transformative companies. Um, ones going back to my my description of the the range there is out there from compliance to defining yourself by your social and ecological utility, mm. and there are too few companies out there doing that, um, and they tend to be the same old chestnuts that get um, hauled out, like Patagonia, for example, thing out of company. Exactly the organisation that came to mind when you said that, and there are too few of them. Um, there's there's some small niche ones um, that that could scale. So um, we've written a lot about transformation. Myself and my brother over the the last ten years. Um, so for us, it's it's looking for um, some more of those um, and trying to work with some more of those. But also um, not just doing that. We we do and deliberately want to, and I think it's very valuable to work with mainstream companies who are having impacts, producing things that we need, and it's vital that their um, that their impacts are reduced and they move through that progression of ambition to reducing their impacts over time to, or towards zero and then actually putting utility or value back into um, society and the environment as well. Yeah. True. And if people want to get an idea of the various different things that you cover, the website is, where is it? Because your blog is fantastic. Terrafinity.com, is that right? That's right, yeah. Okay. Have a look at Terrafinity.com on the blog section. Uh, it gives you a good idea of the kind of expertise that, that Dominic and his brother and, and co are, are looking into. In other news on what's next, am I right in saying you're into wildlife photography? Yes. Any uh, any trips or anything like that planned? Any subjects well, you're looking to capture? I, I had an abortive attempt at trying to post grub mountain hares in the Peak District. Um, oh, okay. Uh, last year and earlier this year. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try and have another bash at them. Abortive. Is it? The first time round, there was a landslip on Snake Pass, and it was impassable after some heavy climate change related rain. And um, made it up earlier this year, but um, there was very, very low cloud base yeah. and snow forecast, so we couldn't couldn't go up on the hill, and even if we had, we wouldn't have been able to see the hair, let alone photograph them. Yeah, although a snowy background would be fantastic. If you get that. would be fantastic, but a small white animal hiding behind some uh, purple moor grass covered in snow, you're not even going to see it, see, see it. This is true. That would be even more of a challenge. Well, hopefully the next trip goes well. You could do with that one. Uh, now, we always finish our podcast with the same question. If you're able to influence world leaders for a day, what would you concentrate your efforts on? I would say we need some new thinking. We need some new thinking that's centred on, on people, both people and the environment. Um, the old thinking has got us to where we are. Um, which isn't all bad. Um, there have been huge improvements in public health and education and a whole number of um, indicators like that, although many of them have been going backwards in the last two or three years. But we've done it on the back of massive environmental degradation and climate change. So how, how are we going to move forward? And I'd say new thinking is needed. Um, and it needs to be more people in environment based and less to do with money. We need to remember that money is a social construct and it's there to serve us. And we kind of ended up the other way around with that. We all seem to be chasing money and everything made around an economic decision. We need an economy, but we need an economy that meets our needs and the needs of the planet. And, and that's 
it should be subservient to us rather than we should be driven by it. So that's what I would say, and I would hope that they might listen even a tiny bit. A change of perspective by the sounds of it. And that brings us to the end of our podcast today. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dominic. It's been fantastic to hear your views and your experience to, experiences to date. Well, thank you very much, Phil. I really enjoyed it. And I just hope I, if I can manage to enthuse just one person to follow at least vaguely in my footsteps, that would be great. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, now, if, if you were interested in doing that, and if you wanted to follow in Dominic's footsteps by becoming a Chartered Environmentalist and showcasing your environmental knowledge, then please check out the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management website, which is siem.net, S-C-I-E-E-M.net, and we'll put a direct link to the Chartered Environmentalist page in the podcast description. Just give that a click or a tap. Next month, we're delving into the world of water science, so subscribe to our podcast and don't miss that. And we shall see you then. Thank you for listening to today's Envcast episode. If you'd like to hear more about the Chartered Environmentalist, Registered Environmental Practitioner or Registered Environmental Technician registrations, please look at our resources available at socenv.org.uk. Alternatively, visit our YouTube channel where you can find a variety of environmental webinar series uh, registration guides and various insights from registrants themselves. Just search for Society for the Environment on YouTube. To keep up to date with what's going on at the Society for the Environment, you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at SOCENV underscore HQ and via LinkedIn by searching for Society for the Environment with SOCENV in the brackets. We will release a new Envcast episode on the first Wednesday of each month. So if you're interested in future podcasts, please do subscribe. You can subscribe and review through a variety of platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Castbox.